Good morning. Welcome to the seminar. My name is Ali Rose. I'm Chief of Place, Space and Communities Division at Geoscience Australia. I'd like to begin today's seminar by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and to pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to extend that respect to any First Nations people participating in our seminar today. So I'm excited. This morning's seminar is Building Australia's Economic, Social and Environmental Growth and Resilience Through Location. Through Commonwealth and state, ter state and Territory Government Partnerships, the National Location Branch here at Geoscience Australia implements cutting edge approaches to integrate and deliver data, services and analytic capability to public, government and critical industries. This Distinguished Guest Australia, uh, Geoscience Australia Lecture, or DGAL for short, will present examples of analysed work, work that is central to the Australian government's ambitious digital economy strategy to make Australia a leading digital economy by 2030, along with the Australian data strategy to ensure government data is in the best state to feed this future digital economy. Specifically, the talk will cover five key themes. The first will be our new program, the Digital Atlas of Australia. In, the next will be improving geospatial data and services discovery, sharing and access. The third will cover the Australian low water coastline. The fourth, bringing our historical aerial imagery archive back to life. And finally, we'll hear about the Elvis portal, creating sustainable access through collaboration. All of our presenters this morning are NLI staff with a decade or two of experience in their selective fields of expertise. To present today, we have no less than six distinguished guest lecturers. We have Irina Bastrakova, Matt Jacob, Martin Kapabianko, uh, Duncan Moore, Demita Botorovsky and Robert Kay. You will have seen their short bio uh, biographical notes on our promotions for this talk, and they have much to get through. So without further ado, I'll now hand over to Irina. Over to you, Irina. Thank you very much, Alison, for this nice introduction. And I will be facilitating the rest of the uh, webinar. So our first presentation is about the Digital Atlas of Australia. It's the next generation of the Australian government location-based data infrastructure. And the presenter is uh, Matt Jacob. So I'll just go to the slide mode and pass it on to Matt. Welcome, Matt. Thanks, Irina, and good morning, everybody. Um, in this year's federal budget, the government committed $40 million to build a digital atlas of Australia, which will be led by Geoscience Australia. And this is part of uh, the $1.2 billion digital economy strategy package, which has a range of measures focused on improving the accessibility and discoverability of the wealth of data held by Commonwealth organisations. The digital atlas of Australia will be a free, online, secure and interactive map of Australia you will be able to find rich, authoritative and trusted data about Australia as it is now, as it was in the past and how it might look into the future. It will be the next generation of the Australian government's location-based data infrastructure that has data on Australia's population, economy, employment, infrastructure, health, land and the environment. You will be able to access tools that let you analyse, such as comparing data for different places or for the same place through time. You will be able to personalise that information to suit your interests and your decision-making needs, including downloading what you create or taking APIs to put into your own applications, uh, helping you to make faster, cheaper and smarter decisions from trusted open data of Australia's geography and more. Geoscience Australia will be partnering with a number of other Australian government organisations in the first instance to deliver the Digital Atlas of Australia, but later with state and private sector organisations to connect and make accessible a wealth of data. 
This announcement is the culmination of work that Geoscience Australia has been undertaking with our partners across the Australian Government, including the recently formed Location Interdepartmental Committee, or IDC, a partnership of over 15 departments coming together to join up our geospatial people, platform, policies and partnerships. Some everyday uses of how the Digital Atlas of Australia will be used include a working family with young children making a tree change move to Wagga Wagga can use tools in the Digital Atlas of Australia to show which suburbs are nearest to their preferred schools and childcare centres, as well as uh, proximity to public transport links, recreation parks, green spaces and playgrounds. A retired couple planning an interstate holiday to the Sunshine Coast can use the Digital Atlas of Australia to create a customised map showing them where the nearest healthcare services are from their accommodation, such as hospitals, GPs, pharmacies, as well as other public amenities like disabled toilets. A landholder in the Barclay Tablelands trying to get their goods to market can use tools in the Digital Atlas of Australia to help them calculate the best transport route to take and to see what transport routes need upgrading. A southern-based business wanting to expand north can use the Digital Atlas of Australia to bring different data together to make the best decision. Figures on population growth and employment trends in the region together with site-specific information on land use and land ownership. An infrastructure developer in far north Queensland can use interactive 3D slope and elevation data from the Digital Atlas of Australia to help them work out where roads, dams and buildings should go, or how much earth to move, how high to build and where the best view might be, and use historical aerial images of the area over time to better understand that area's history for more in-depth due diligence and de-risking. And an Indigenous landholder in Catherine looking over their country can use the Digital Atlas of Australia to help them work out what to do with their land, where to develop, what to protect, and how to inform their development agenda in the region. The Digital Atlas of Australia will be developed and managed with appropriate security protocols. The platform will be developed using a secure by design approach, building on the learnings and implementation of the existing national map. Risks will be managed by limiting access to sensitive data sets to authenticated government users and building the public interface to only include data that is non-sensitive and unrestricted for use. The initial version of Digital Atlas of Australia will be available and accessible to the public, business and government from late 2022. In the years following its release, Geoscience Australia will enhance the Digital Atlas of Australia by adding, adding modern analytical tools and richer national data sets. Through to June 2024, we will see the Digital Atlas of Australia support strong growth in digital decision making across business, government and community. In partnership with our state and territory colleagues, including through the Australian and New Zealand Land Information Council, or ANSLIC, the Commonwealth sees digital twin technology as a big part of the Digital Atlas of Australia into the future. Digital twins offer a 3D and 4D immersive and dynamic environment where faster, smarter and cheaper decisions can be made. For the Commonwealth Government, using the proactive and predictive tools of digital twin technology will revolutionise policy and program design and implementation, extracting even greater data, value from data. As the platform matures, data in the Australian uh, Digital Atlas of Australia will be accessible where appropriate to both humans and machines, enabling innovative uses through new applications and technologies including, but not limited to, artificial intelligence and machine learning. The detail of how these new technologies will be integrated into the Digital Atlas of Australia will come from an evaluation of the platform at year three. This evaluation will inform a roadmap for future incorporation of industry partnerships, data from smart devices and artificial intelligence. There are many factors that will help ensure the Digital Atlas of Australia is successful. It will rely on better leadership of spatial data coordination federally through the Location IDC with jurisdictions through ANSLIC and the Intergovernmental Committee on Surveying and Mapping or ICSM and with the spatial private sector. Improvements in data sharing will also be the key, a key to the success of Digital Atlas of Australia. 
which is why Geoscience Australia welcomed the signing of the Intergovernmental Agreement on Data Sharing by the National Cabinet on the 9th of July this year. The Intergovernmental Agreement on Data Sharing commits all jurisdictions to share public sector data with one another as a default position, where it can be done securely, safely, lawfully and ethically. The agreement recognises data as a shared national asset and aims to maximise the value of data to deliver outstanding policies and services for Australians. The agreement applies to a wide scope of public sector data, including location information. Data and digital ministers are finalising the first national data sharing work program in consultation with portfolio ministers. Geoscience Australia will eagerly follow the, the development of the first work program of national priority areas by the ministers, given data sharing is an important factor in the success of Digital Atlas of Australia. Geoscience Australia will also, also continues to assist in developing the Australian data strategy to ensure location data is included in the strategy and that Digital Atlas of Australia remains aligned with this work. Continued government support for location information is critical to the success of Digital Atlas of Australia. Having location data concepts embedded in the Australian data strategy will help ensure there is continued recognition, drive and support behind the importance of location information from successive governments in Australia. The Digital Atlas of Australia is further affirmation of the relevance and importance of geospatial information in transforming Australia into a modern and leading digital economy by 2030. And pleasingly, the government's Digital Atlas of Australia budget announcement has generated a genuine boost in excitement, positivity and support across the spatial sector. Since the announcement, Geoscience Australia has been approached and has had discussions with many in the spatial sector wanting to learn more about the Digital Atlas of Australia and how they can get involved. Digital uh, Geoscience Australia is in active planning for the program and technology strategy and we are engaged with our core partners across federal and state governments. There will be more to come in early 2022 on how to get involved. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for sharing this grant vision about the Digital Atlas of Australia and its benefits for the future. So our next talk uh, is about metadata. Metadata is really very important for the Digital Atlas of Australia as an enabler for quick and reliable discovery and access and share of authoritative data and services. So this presentation by Martin Capabianca is about the benefits of uh, metadata and also our collaborative work with the emergency management sector. Thank you, Martin. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the introduction, Irina. Um, it was not too long ago that metadata was considered a dry topic of conversation. It's always been considered as the nice to have capability and low on the list of priorities. However, recently there has been a shift. Metadata is now on everyone's radar, gaining traction in government, industry and research communities. The importance of metadata and standards is now recognized with organizations investigating and implementing in this capability. An example of this is the intergovernmental agreement on data sharing between Commonwealth and state and territory governments, which recognizes metadata as a vital component for improving data discoverability for access and use. Using metadata standards improves the quality of metadata, accessibility and usability of resources. It improves the management of resources while facilitating in the interoperability and automation of machine to machine connectivity. Having consistent metadata enables users and consumers to find, assess, verify and consume resources efficiently and enables owners to create, manage and distribute resources effectively. It aids organisations and entities with good governance, visibility and life cycle management of their assets. Next slide, please. What are the risks of having poor quality metadata? There are many risks associated with poor quality and management of metadata. Some risks are evident right away, while others take a lot longer. Issues like the inability to find the correct resource, for example, poor keywording or search terms, which can leave a user frustrated in their search endeavors due to the lack of desired results. 
determining if the resource is usable or fit for purpose, such as incorrect licensing and use limitations, difficulties in accessing the resource because there are no downloads or endpoints or links, and the ability to properly and consistently manage resources, which can result in the currency and validity of a resource to suffer. While each of these issues may be small, they can tarnish the reputation of a trusted resource. A frustrated user and consumer will not likely return and offer often express their experiences with others. Next slide, please. I'd like to play a short clip which expands on the importance of fit for purpose metadata and why do we need it? To maximize the power of metadata, it needs to be fit for purpose and follow one of common metadata standards. Such standards are complex but are essential for any business to describe, manage, and promote its data, services, products, and other resources. Metadata standards are also important to enable targeted searches for those resources in catalogs or on the web, understanding their currency and fitness for purpose. Metadata standards are created in a generic way to cover many use cases, communities and purposes. Experts who develop metadata standards define architecture, elements and rules which are common for all metadata use cases, communities and purposes. As an analogy, it can be compared with creating a generic pizza recipe and listing all ingredients which can be used. In this example, a group of chefs can define the temperature of the oven, how to make a pizza base, and what ingredients should be used for the pizza's dough and topping. However, while the temperature of the oven and ingredients for the pizza base might remain the same for all pizzas, people might want to order different pizza types. Each of these pizza types would have a unique combination of a few selected ingredients as toppings, say margarita or capriciosa. As chefs agree on these ingredients and publish them as a particular pizza recipe, we can order the same pizza type every time from many venues. Similar rules apply to metadata. While the structure, common rules and main elements of the metadata may remain the same, Metadata profiles need to be created to fit particular use cases, communities or purposes. For example, elements and keywords describing natural hazards data sets like floods and earthquakes would be different from elements and keywords for the data sets describing geological features or buildings or roads. As metadata and data experts agree on business rules, elements and keywords relevant to a particular use case as a metadata profile, it can be published to enable its consistent reuse across multiple organisations. Creating different metadata profiles is not difficult. Bringing together metadata and data experts and using their combined knowledge to create perfect metadata recipes benefits each community in many ways. Firstly, Similarly, with pizza oven settings and base creation, having consistent infrastructure and implementation using the same metadata standards empowers seamless integration of metadata across multiple catalogs. Secondly, like using the same ingredients for a particular pizza recipe, fit for purpose metadata profiles help to describe resources, their fitness and application within specific use cases, communities and purposes. Thirdly, similar to our expectations of having the same experience when we order a particular pizza type, the metadata users will be able to fulfil their expectations of finding useful and adequately described for their use case, community or purpose, products, data sets, services and other resources. The ICSM Metadata Working Group, as a group of metadata and domain experts, can assist you with developing those metadata profiles and templates. Through groups such as MCNA, Emergency Management Spatial Information Network Australia, there has been an initiative to focus on establishing a metadata capability for the sector. With a commitment to improving safety for Australians through the use of sound decision making supported by spatial information technologies. The emergency management sector now has access to a metadata tool known as Ansmed Lite version 2 
to create standard compliant metadata which can validate and export metadata for custodians. Just like the pizza analogy from the video, it also adopts the Emer Emergency Management Metadata Profile or recipe, which was developed from the sector's requirements and use cases. This is an extension to the ISO 19115-1 profile to identify the metadata required to accurately describe emergency management resources and is designed to support the documentation of and discovery of emergency management data set services and other resources. The ANSMET Lite version 2 incorporates the profile through the implementation of templates, which essentially creates a rule set for the metadata entry form within the tool. MCNA is a demonstration of a pattern which can be applied to other sectors, fields and requirements. As of now, compliant metadata can be created and exported out of the metadata tool. And additionally, the ANSMET Lite version 2 is open source and ready to be adopted and deployed into any infrastructure. The work undertaken is evidence that now anyone can begin creating quality compliant metadata and implement a metadata capability. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. So yes, having um, adequately described metadata to support emergency management and other sectors are extremely important to discover their data. So our next um, several talks are about data and how application of modern technologies uh, can improve our understanding of it and access to it. So the next presenter is Duncan Moore and he's going to talk about Australian low water coastlines and how our understanding of it uh, can improve Australian economy and security. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you, Irina. Okay. So, firstly, looking at the a bit of history here, um, the coastline was first charted in to some extent by the Dutch. This is a chart from the 17th century. Um, in this case, the Dutch were interested in, in fact, avoiding Australia's coastline um, on their transit through the East Indies, as it was at the time, um, in terms of their trade. So if we fast forward to the early 19th century, we start to get a complete picture of Australia's coastline as we recognise it today. This chart was produced by Freycinet. Um, it was completed following the expedition of Baudin uh, and is produced in 1811. Now, this is the first complete coastline of Australia. Uh, and subsequently to this, Matthew Flinders published his chart in 1814, which people may be familiar with. In fact, uh, Flinders was the first to circumnavigate Australia, um, but held up on his return journey to England by the French on the island of Mauritius for six and a half years. So likely this held up his publication to some extent. Now there are parallels here in terms of Flinders work as his chart is combined from several different sources. Um, his chart was combined with his own surveying, but also the work of others to produce what is a, a composite view here. And there are parallels to our current national low water coastline as well that I'll come back to later on. Okay, so why do we map the low water coastline in modern times? Um, I've listed some regulation zones there that rely on the coastline. And essentially it's because the coastline forms the edge of a regulated zone. Um, and, and these are some examples here. And these are some of our purposes in government, but no doubt there are other uses out there and that, that returns greater value in terms of publicly releasing this coastline so others can make use of it. But the, the regulated zones already exist. So the question is to why remap the coastline? Largely it's due to the language that's used in policy and legislation. Often the language used for the coastline represents the physical coastline, such that you can walk down there and you can dip your toes in it. So this is a coastline that I'm showing here in white. This is for the Royal National Park or a section of it in New South Wales. And you can see what is a cartographic representation of that coastline. And if I bring in, this is now in red, coastline derived from aerial photography. And you can see a much better match in terms of the coastline there 
to the image underneath. Far more detail in that coastline capture as well. So if you're talking about a physical coastline, what we're now producing is much closer to that in, in terms of a data realisation. And how have we gone about doing this? Well, definitely we haven't done this work alone. Um, it's relied on both federal, state and territory governments and also academia to get us to where we are today. We've drawn upon historical aero photography in archival data. We've gone out and captured further aero photography for priority areas. We're relying on satellite data, the efforts of academia, and many, many people. In fact, the vast majority of people who are working on this project sit outside Geoscience Australia. And so that's required strong leadership. Um, and at this stage, I'll mention the effort of Grant Boys, who retired in January this year, but for the previous 10 years, uh, led this project and got us to the point now that we can start to release this data. And this is our stage one release. Uh, important to note here that we are looking at a stage release. We don't want the perfect to get in the way of the good. So we will be issuing further releases through time as we improve upon the data set. Here you'll note in, uh, in red, we've got a coastline which is derived from stereo aerial photography. It's a surveyed coastline such that we saw in the previous example for the Royal National Park. For Western Australia, there are orange coastline outlines there. This is from monoscopic aerial photography, and again, as a surveyed coastline. And for the vast remainder in green, we've got a coastline there which is derived from the Digital Earth Australia um, Landsat data cube. Specifically, it's the high tide, low tide composite that we've used. We've applied the normalized difference water index to that um, product and then smoothed that coastline to produce the, the remaining infill there. And just in terms of comparing that coastline, here we have an example for Port Phillip Bay. Again, in red, we're looking at a surveyed coastline here. It is low water, so you can see how far it extends off the, off the beach. The pink outline just introduced is the geoscape coastline for Victoria. You can see that it much more approximates the high water coastline. It's up on the vegetation there. It's not a great match to the surveyed coastline for low water. Here we have the one to 100,000 coastline, which was produced in the 1970s. Uh, again, not a great match to the surveyed coastline. And you can see it's quite blocky there. So it's suited to a, a much different scale that, than we are working here today. And lastly, this is the DEA low tide composite coastline that we have extracted. And you can see a much better match to the surveyed coastline. Um, this is one example that we're doing a visual assessment of here, but we have done a proximity analysis of the surveyed coastline to each of the three other sources. And we found that the DEA low tide composite coastline is in fact the best match. So that's the reason why we've gone with that, that coastline. In terms of further releases, um, the current stage one release we're looking at releasing in the next uh, week or so, so that will be out soon. But subsequent to that, we're looking at including the uh, coastline for the Great Barrier Reef and Torres Strait, as you can see outlined in pink on that image. This is work done by James Cook University. Um, they've drawn upon the Australian Hydrographic Office um, archival data to produce that, those extents. We're also looking at including a rivers data set. So here you can see the DEA coastline in green. And if I then add in a river extent, you can see that we have further uh, coastline defined from that other data set. So we're looking at including that too to give us broader coverage. There's also further survey work being done for the Queensland coastline. So as that comes online, that will also be integrated into the product and then released in a subsequent version. Now, if this interests you as much as it does me, certainly there's our contact details there and I can keep you informed as to the development of this, of this product. And it's important to note that this will, at, upon completion, this will be the best representation of Australia's geography ever seen. And in large part, it's thanks to all of our external stakeholders. So thank you for your time and I'll leave it there. Thank you, Duncan. Thanks for the excellent um, 
introduction to how modern technology can improve uh, our understanding of the coastlines. So our next presenter is Dmitry Batrovsky. And Dmitry is going, go, going to talk about bringing historic aerial imagery archive back to life and how it helped us to understand changes of the Australian landscape and environment through time. Thank you, Dmitry. Thank you, Irina, uh, and good day, everyone. Uh, today, uh, I will take you on a short journey uh, about work that Geoscience Australia is undertaking uh, to modernize management and improve access to a large collection of historical aerial photography. Geoscience Australia is the custodian of a nationally significant collection of aerial photography. The collection is created by our predecessor agencies the Australian Survey and Land Information Group, the Australian Survey Office, and the Division of National Mapping. Its significance is that it provides a 70-year window into understanding the Australian landscape. Majority of collection predates other comparable data sources, such as high resolution, satellite imagery, or contemporary digital area photography. Information in the collection is unique, irreplaceable, and essential for effective planning, decision-making, and knowledge of our landscape. This pictorial shows the distribution of material in the collection by year of capture. The information collected uh, dates from as far back as July 1928 and up until mid-1990s. Interestingly, but unsurprisingly, a lot of capture in terms of volume coincides with the war effort uh, to map north of the country in 1940s and with the national mapping programs where, where, where aerial photography was primary data source for uh, net map photo maps, R502s and national topographic map series mapping. Why should we care about the old aerial films and photos? It is a perfectly valid question. What we do must have some rationale and justification. I would say it, it is a typical case of repurposing data for something beyond what the original data capture objective was. It is about creating new value from all data. For example, there are businesses who rely on historical imagery as input into their environmental risk reports. This work commissioned by other parties such as developers and investors. Knowing what was at a location in the past is important input to risk assessments. Remember, in the most cases, this photography was collected for the purpose of making a topographic map. That involved interpreting features captured by the camera and using cartographic process, this information is filtered and reduced, reduced by uh, only select things of interest meeting topographic specifications being shown on a map. However, when, our, when other data are not of interest to map makers, for example, all business directories or yellow pages are joined to information interpreted from historical images, additional context and value is being created. Was there a chemical processing facility in the past? Was was there a landfill or a rubbish tip uh, that a new multi-million dollar, dollar road project needs to cross? As new outer sub, uh, suburban lands open up for housing development, were there farming practices in the past conducted uh, that have a contaminated land uh, with arsenic and pesticides? All these questions need to be answered to help understand environmental risk to health and to investment into infrastructure projects. There are many use cases now for historical aerial photography. The common thing is the need to understand how our landscape has changed and what was there before. It is about facts to support decision making and provide certainty. It is a record of our history and one it is irreplaceable. Here, here is a typical uh, digital output from the film scanning process. Most of the film scanned to date is uh, at 15 to 16 microns resolution uh, and 
any future scanning will be com uh, commissioned uh, at a uh, better resolution. The ground sampling distance, that is the distance between adjoining image pixel centers, uh, will depend on the scanning resolution and the scale of original photography. But in most cases, uh, for material in our collection will be in the order of uh, tens of centimeters to a few meters. Aerial photography is a little special than other data. There is a structure to how data is organized and this is codified in flat diagrams, also known as key diagrams. Most of the key diagrams are organized around map indexes and have critical information about film numbers, survey dates, and key flight parameters, approximate location of selected frames, and so on. In essence, they are a depiction of how, now digitized, data is organized and their approximate geographic location. Metadata on key diagrams had to be transcribed into a relational database to allow indexing a search of material in our collection. We have developed a portal site and a catalog search application that provides additional information about the historical area of photography and public access. Users are able to easily identify material in the collection of interest to them, not only by searching structured metadata, but also using special search which presents our collection on a map. Catalog also indicates what material has been digitized as only one part of collection is digital so far, and all material digitals can be downloaded at the highest resolution possible. Chesan Sassela is preparing to commence uh, building a new historical aerial image based digital product from next uh, calendar year. It will provide a seamless image services across the country, joining the postage stamps of individual images image frames and uh, map sheet mosaics into uh, image uh, into an image map of Australia to time, easily consumable in digital platforms such as digital atlas. Building the product will involve accurate placement of uh, and rectification of scan material, uh, using other imagery to reference it and then produce uh, the, the mosaics. This will further enhance value of the collection by enabling overlay or uh, comparison side by side with other base maps such as satellite imagery. Here we have a few examples of old photography taken in 1966 viewed alongside the recent satellite imagery and tools that enable visual comparison. And here are some examples of uh, specific uh, you know, uh, locations where we can actually de detect change uh, since 1966. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much, Dmitry. It was very interesting and lots of examples of how our landscape is changing for time. Our final presentation today is by Rob Kay, and it's going to be about Elvis, our central access point to National Wide Elevation Data Repository. So. Uh, Rob is going to talk about our collaboration uh, across Australia to develop this portal and about benefits to the governments, industry and the public on um, using all of this uh, access uh, point. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Irina. <clears throat> Hello everyone, um, I'll just start with what Elvis actually is. So Elvis is a shared infrastructure built to deliver open foundation elevation data to whoever needs it. It was built in, in 2016 as a replacement for the National, uh, National Elevation Data Framework Portal with the goal of making the open foundation elevation data discoverable and easily accessible. Uh, this is what it looks like. This is the website. Um, so while, while it was originally developed to deliver GA data, it was soon expanded to include New South Wales and Queensland data. So users can now access data from nine different jurisdictions or agencies, 
making it a truly collaborative effort. And why did we build it? Uh, elevation data is costly to capture and valuable to many sectors. Uh, it's historically difficult to distribute and costly to distribute because of its size. And at the time of development, uh, we had some new cloud technologies that were had opened up options for um, efficient automated delivery. Okay. Uh, governance. Elvis is an ICSM owned application. So it's managed under the Elvis, Elvis Working Group. And it's a collaborative effort between the partners shown here. Uh, so most of these partners have a member on the working group and the majority of their el elevation data collections are available through Elvis. All right, I'm gonna just cover some benefits of collaboration that we found. Um, we found that through collaboration, we've strengthened relationships, increased knowledge sharing across organizations. Uh, we're able to store data once and access it by many, so that's applications and individuals. Uh, we've been able to develop reusable services for data access and query. And it's also led to standardization for um, easier end user um, access and, and usage of the data. And it's proven quite cost effective. Okay, here's a, a quick demonstration on how it works. This is generalized, but um, users access the data catalog through a shop front or the web page. Through here, they can query the catalog and build a, a shopping list. The shopping list is sent to a processing factory, which is made up of an FME server and some AWS serverless workflows. These, this processing factory accesses data warehouses, which uh, it's important to note that these can be distributed data warehouses, so they can um, exist in different cloud accounts. And when the data is processed, a notification is sent back to the user. This shows an example of some of the high resolution elevation data that can be, um, can be accessed through the system. This is, an, this is an example of a bare earth digital elevation model or DEM. Uh, here's the same model with some building models uh, overlaid on top of it. And lastly, the, this is an example of some of the point data or point cloud data that can be um, accessed through the system. So this is the vegetation points from the LIDAR data set that was used to derive the underlying models. The system's designed to be easy to use. You just draw an area of interest on the map and it returns a list of all the data sets available um, within that area. So that's divided on the right hand side by the data owner and the data type. And once the order is complete, the users uh, sent an email link, an email with the download link to the data so they can get a local copy of it. If the users don't want a local copy, we've got some services and tools that are available that allow them to query the data in place. So here's an example of the elevation at point tool where you can click on a map, any location on the map, and it'll return the elevation from the highest resolution data set at that point. All right, one of the big benefits of the system is the analytics uh, workflows that are in place and the user surveys that we've been able to do from it. Um, we've got some uh, automated workflows that deliver these reports. These are monthly reports that give us some information on the user base and the system usage to help us improve it down the track. Um, here's an example of a monthly report. It's a targeted report that's sent out to all of the data owners and um, targeted to their data. And it summarizes usage to statistics for the month. Um, so this, this is, information is important because it can provide strong justification for ongoing capture programs and open data policies. So here we're seeing the general summary statistics for the month and some trends in monthly orders over time. Uh, we can also get some insights into the user base uh, here we're showing the 
uh, monthly unique users over the last year. And we also have information about what sector the users are coming from. So this is important because in the past, we targeted our data more towards government, so the data needs of government. But since this system's been in place, we've um, shown us that the majority of the elevation requests are coming from the engineering sector. So the, um, it gives us an idea on what they're after and what types of data and um, extents that they're after. This is a quick shot showing uh, the hotspots. We can get hotspots and um, highly requested data sets. And we can also look at trends over the long term with custom reporting. So here's the trend in monthly orders since the system was started and the percent growth in orders over the uh, years. And uh, just to wrap up, I'm just going to talk about the surveys and the feedback. This gives us information on what users do and don't like, which feeds into our forward planning and development for the system. So where to target surveys, what data formats and APIs we develop. We've also got some information on the value of the system and the open data to users. And uh, we've been able to identify some of the benefits. Here's a look at some, um, some data we've been able to extrapolate on the value. And you can see it's a very large sum that we've come up with at the end. But even if we erred on the extreme conservative side, that's a great demonstration on the value of the system and the open data. And lastly, here are a few use cases under some of the um, the benefits that we found and uh, just another uh, good demonstration on the, the benefits of making data open and easily accessible through collaboration with our partners. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. So it's exciting to hear how just one application can provide so much benefits and cover so many uh, use cases uh, in Australia and beyond. So I would like to thank every presenter for their wonderful uh, contribution to today's public talk. And now it's back to you, Ali. Thanks, Irina. I think that was an excellent overview of some of our core foundation spatial capabilities and data sets here at Geoscience Australia. And just to go back to the start of the presentation, foundation spatial data is just essential uh, in supporting opportunities and challenges uh, within Australia's economy, society and environment. So great presentations. Thank you very much. I'd now like to take questions from the audience. And I note that we do have one question online, which I think goes to you, Irene, or perhaps Matt. Uh, what is the main software that Geoscience Australia intends to use to obtain 3D mapping in relation to smart cities? So that's a digital twin technology that, that we expect to bring into Digital Atlas of Australia. Yep, thanks very much for that question. Um, so the... Um, in terms of the uh, collection of uh, 3D data for uh, particularly for, for urban areas, um, that's um, that's going to be a responsibility of their uh, partners in the state and territory governments. Um, it's, uh, it's highly unlikely that Geoscience Australia will actually um, lead any uh, data collection in that regard. So, uh, so and it is hoped that. Uh, uh, as um, as the program evolves, that uh, the state and territory governments will uh, will share uh, that uh, that data um, and uh, any data that then flows into their digital twins uh, into uh, the Digital Atlas of Australia program. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I would probably like to add to it. So, Geoscience Australia is involved at the moment with a quite significant activity and building partnerships with our partners within jurisdictions and lots of those technologies are identified now but from earlier contenders it's obviously the apis it's using all of standards like just um, um, smart cities gml 
and also uh, use of um, technologies like artificial intelligence and um, machine learning. So it's probably just addition. Okay, thanks, Irina. We have a question that's coming for Duncan. With the coastlines, are you dealing with change over time, such as coastal aggradation, growth, and erosion or retreat? Is this something that will be wanted by those uh, using the remapped coastlines? That, that's a good question, and I think the answer is yes. Um, certainly in a lot of our cases looking at regulated zones, we do have to consider the movement in the coastline. And there are um, products we're looking at, such as the DEA coastlines product, which does show that movement through time. So in some cases, you may want to have the outside edge um, to, to use that. We might want to use perhaps some sort of spatial average. So we are looking at that to include in some of the upcoming release. That's great. Thanks for that response, Duncan. I think uh, there's just one comment that's here, and I think it's maybe more to Martin. It's not a question, but a comment. And it notes that future requests is, in terms of metadata, is for a Soundex type search to resolve multiple spellings of the same words. Is that being taken into consideration with some of our ISO metadata standards? Um, the, there's been a, a focus on controlled vocabularies, which will um, mitigate those types of issues. Um, and accessing through a tool, um, which, which the standard does support in terms of those um, vocabularies that you can access and have available, um, essentially as a, as a drop down or a pick list of, um, of terms that, that, yeah, that essentially resolve that issue. Thanks, that's great. Okay, um, I'm not seeing any further questions come in. I'd like to thank our distinguished Geoscience Australia lecturers today, um, a great series of presentations, and I'm sure all of those folks online that are watch, uh, watching and listening in will jump on our GA website and find access to all of those capabilities. Next week, our Wednesday seminar will be presented by Dr. Keith Serkham, the Director of Laboratories in Geoscience Australia's Minerals, Energy and Groundwater Division. He'll be explaining the core capabilities, quality management role and future directions of the laboratory in a seminar entitled The Geoscience Australia Laboratory, Today's Quality is Tomorrow's Reputation. Please join us then. Thanks very much for joining us today.